Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so happy that you have joined us this morning as we worship God. And our first reading this morning comes from the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus, beginning with the first verse and proceeding through verse 14. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the member or the number of people who eat of it, and your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall not, or you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Our second reading comes from the 13th chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, beginning with the 8th verse and proceeding through verse 14. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And finally, from the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning in the 18th chapter with the 15th verse, 
and proceeding through verse 20. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth but anything about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is read and proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. I'm rather fond of the story of a man who arrived at the pearly gates and was told immediately by Peter to enter God's throne room to be judged. Peter leaves him alone in the room and tells him, God will be with you shortly. Awed by his surroundings, the man began to look around God's throne room and on one complete wall, he noticed it was nothing but a huge window looking down on earth. From this height, he could see just how beautiful the earth is with its blue waters and green forests and white clouds. Next to God's throne was a small table on which there was, of all things, a pair of eyeglasses. And soon curiosity got the better of this man. And so after sneaking a peek to ensure that no one was looking at him, he walked over to this table and put on the eyeglasses and turned around and looked out the window. And all of a sudden his view had changed. Because as he looked on earth, instead of seeing beauty, he saw hunger and poverty, sickness, and unmentionable acts of cruelty perpetrated by other human beings, oftentimes in God's own name. And he was absolutely horrified by what he saw. The longer this man watched, the angrier he became. Suddenly, the voice of God echoed through the throne room, please take off my glasses. And the man immediately did as he was told, and he stood there trembling before God, waiting to be punished for his presumption. But after a pause, God simply asked, what did you see? And the man explained that he saw hatred and corruption, and evil. Then God asked, and did you feel any love or compassion for those on earth? 
No, the man replied. After what I saw, I would have destroyed the whole planet without hesitation or regret if it were in my power to do so. God gently smiled at the man and said, that's why only I can wear those glasses. You may not see what I see unless you can feel what I feel. I marvel at the grace of God. I'm astonished that someone who knows intimately all of those horrible and shameful things that we do to ourselves and to others and to God can still feel love and compassion for us. I am astounded by the lengths to which God goes to redeem and restore us all. And I can't imagine that I am alone in such thinking. Take, for instance, this morning's reading from Exodus. Because beyond all of the religious and liturgical requirements of slaughtering a year old male lamb, beyond all the instructions of how to cook it and eat it and what to do with its blood, beyond the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs and the prohibition to keep any leftovers, there was one important truth. God was about to redeem the Israelites from the bonds of oppression and slavery. After four centuries of enduring unspeakable cruelty at the hands of the Egyptians, God's chosen people were about to be liberated. Now, admittedly, the story of this night is told from the perspective of those who were being liberated. So, of course, this would be viewed as a festive occasion. But one would hardly imagine that the Egyptians would have remembered that night with quite the same feelings of joy. God even says, I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. And those words cause many of us today to bristle at how harsh and unfair those words and actions seem. Think about it for a moment. The firstborn in Egypt, in many cases, were likely small children or infants. And as such would have been totally blameless for those 400 years of oppression. And if this were the only image of God revealed to us in Scripture, then we might find very few people willing to commit their lives to such a God. But fortunately, it is not. Because we also, in the pages of Scripture, encounter a God who is gracious to the enemies of Israel in the book of Jonah. A Messiah who prays even as he is being crucified, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. But I do find it rather interesting that even later generations of Jews would bristle at these events as they are recorded in the book of Exodus. Some of the later rabbis in Israel's history would begin to circulate a story that on the night of the first Passover, the heavenly host rejoiced and celebrated the death of each firstborn Egyptian. When suddenly God's voice rang out through heaven, demanding to know, why do you rejoice? Do you not understand that these are my children too. That sounds a little like 
God's words in the story I told at the beginning of this sermon. You may not see what I see unless you can feel what I feel. Again, bear in mind that these were Jews who circulated that story about the night of the first Passover. And that legend would eventually become part of the liturgy of the celebration of Passover in Jewish homes even today. Because in that liturgy, the people acknowledge that their joy is diminished by the death of their enemies. Their joy is diminished, though not destroyed, because this still remains, first and foremost, a story of redemption. Now, why does that matter? Because as heirs of God's covenant with Abraham, the ancient story of the first Passover becomes part of our story. The redemption of God's people on that night foreshadows for us the redemption won for us by Christ on the cross. Note the words that are so often overlooked in this passage. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. And the implication is very clear. In liberating God's people from servitude to false gods and idols, God is, in fact, liberating us to a lifetime of freedom, which ironically manifests itself in absolute obedience to and service of the one true God. The lamb that was slain for the feast of Passover would become the forerunner of the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The feast of that night became the forerunner of the feast in which we partake around the Lord's table and share our Lord's body and blood. What we see in both the Passover and the crucifixion of our Lord is that how God relates to the world is very, very different than how we do. And because God relates differently to the world and to us, as God's people, so must we. Which I think beautifully summarizes what it is Paul was saying in our reading from Romans this morning. Anyone has spent, who, or who has spent any time reading Paul's letters knows just how much of his time and energy was spent urging and exhorting and preaching to the people of God how to live and behave in response to the grace that God has given. You see, faith for Paul was never just about saying, I believe. Faith included what we do and say and how we live our lives for the glory here and now because we believe. If we affirm that the relationship we have with God is the most important thing in our lives, then our lives should bear witness to that truth. So Paul would echo the words of Jesus, who himself echoed the words of Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. In a day and age where people are being killed, not because they pose any great danger, but because of the color of their skin, by those sworn to protect and serve. Maybe we all need a reminder of that command. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's one thing to 
fulfill this call for love with superficial and saccharine expressions of pious words. It's another thing when it calls us to get down to the nitty gritty of how we actually treat one another. Already, I imagine some of you may be thinking, well, for God, that's pretty easy to do. But I'm not God. Nothing like that is even possible for me. But how many of us have ever really, truly tried to forgive, to love, to be just and merciful? How often is it that we simply respond to being hurt by either trying to ignore the wrong and hoping it goes away, thus inflicting more harm on ourselves and others, or harboring a grudge, plotting our revenge, and waiting until the perfect moment to inflict the most harm possible on the one who hurt us? I think of the words of the poet Robert Blake or William Blake. I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath, my wrath did end. I was angry with my foe, my foe, I told it not, my wrath did grow. Reconciliation is not an impossibility. Do you remember the story of, as a child of the little engine that could? Do you remember the refrain? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Which eventually, by the end of the book, turns into I know I can, I know I can, I know I can. In essence, that's what Jesus is saying about each one of us in Matthew's gospel this morning. We are to be the little church that could. Jesus is laying out on the church in these words just how much trust and faith he has in each one of us who follows him. He actually believes it is possible for us to live lives in ways that show love and mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation, even as we hold one another accountable for our actions, we are to forgive one another for our sins. He actually believes that forgiving others is an opportunity for us to grow in our faith. And why is all that possible? Well, the answer can be found in the fact that these words follow immediately on the heels of Jesus's parable of the lost sheep. You know, the one where the shepherd leaves the 99 who were safe to go find the one that went astray. And the implication is very clear. Each of us is in our own way that one sheep. And our God came looking for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's not God's will, says Jesus in these verses immediately preceding this morning's passage, that any of these little ones should be lost. So God goes to great lengths to ensure that that never happens. And in like manner, Jesus expects the church that bears his name to do the same. That's why he emphasizes over and over again, going back to the one who has sinned so that there might be reconciliation. Read those words again, and you can almost hear Jesus saying over and over in the background, I think you can, I think you can, I think you can. And even in the face of greatest resistance, Jesus says, I know you can. I know you can. I know you can. Now, granted, Jesus does go on to say, after 
an exhaustive effort if the offender still refuses to listen, then such a person should be to the church as a Gentile or a tax collector. But what does that mean? Tradition has told us that after all efforts to be reconciled have failed, then and only then should a person be written off. But is that really what Jesus meant? Maybe we are meant to understand that even then we are not through with such a person. After all, Jesus never wrote off a Gentile or a tax collector, did he? He never once looked at all the hatred and corruption and evil in this world and say, oh, I just can't show love or compassion to that person. Rather than writing any of us off, he gave his very life that we might be reconciled to God and to one another. And thanks to the grace of God and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, we become agents of reconciliation, even when that seems impossible to us, because as Jesus reminds us, where two or three are gathered is in his name. He is there among them. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen.